Hey guys, this is uh, Marcus Kelly, pastor of the exciting Grace Baptist Church right there on Highway 45 between Jackson and Henderson, Tennessee. And I thought I'd spend some time with you uh, this afternoon doing a little throwback Thursday on a, a, a Sunday night message that we had done previously. But real quick, I just want to say uh, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone uh, down there in Florida and Georgia. Um, me and my family, we've got uh, family members um, down there in some of the hardest hit areas. Uh, we've got friends that are down there. We've got, uh, you know, brothers in, uh, in Christ that are down there and that are working and first responders and law enforcement and all of that, man. I just want all you guys to know that our prayers are with you today, man. We're thinking about you and we're praying about you. And then everyone who watches this, uh, I would just covet your prayers for all of them down there that, you know, we would lift them up that, you know, today, uh, we're really seeing a lot of the damage, and it's just catastrophic in some areas. So please be in prayer for them. Um, if we can pray for you in any way, what you could do is down in the comments below, if you would, just, hey, man, pray for me about this or whatever. And uh, me and Alicia, uh, after this, we'll uh, pray for you, and uh, we'll pray with you. So, but anyway, uh, thank you for uh, being with us. I wanted to talk about the question is, why do I need church uh, why do I need to go to church? Why do I need a part to be a part of church? Why do we need church at all? You know, as a matter of fact, the kind of the question that gets asked a lot is, you know, if I'm saved, if I'm a Christian, if I'm a spiritual person, why do I need church? What's the benefit? What's the upside? You hear more and more today people who claim to love Christ, but they hate the church. They claim to love Christ, right? They say, I don't believe in organized religion or I don't need to go to church to be close to God. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very close to Christ, but I don't need the church, right? And a lot of people are very sincere about feeling that way. Matter of fact, we see every year in this country, the percentage of people who attend church regularly, that's like once a month, uh, according to the Pew uh, Research, um, is gone down every year. Excuse me, it's actually gotten worse and worse. It's gotten to the point where there's 8 million 20-something-year-olds that are alive today that by the time uh, they were active in church, they were in church uh, four times a week, uh, whether it was youth group or Sunday, but there are 8 million of them that when they were growing up, they grew up in church, and by the time they're 30, they will have nothing to do with the church at all. Many people, I call them de church they're de church because they're disappointed in church. They've had their feelings hurt or disillusioned or they were disturbed by something that happened, right? A lot of things. I always say when we're talking to our Grace Baptist family, there's no hurt quite as deep as a church hurt. I mean, church hurts hurt, man, and they hurt bad. Sometimes people quit going to church because the pastor said something that made them mad or upset them. They didn't like a particular stand that a church took. Maybe it was a biblical stand or maybe it was an unbiblical stand that the church was uh, taking a stand on. Or maybe they just got into conflict with somebody and they said, you know what, this whole church thing, man, it's just not worth it. Uh, but Christ gave us the church. The scripture is clear that he has given us the church for a reason. And so when we look at that question, is church important? Is going to church even important? Does it matter at all? Uh, I've got to be honest with you guys, and, and, and um, for once, just once. Uh, you do not have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't. Now, that's the dirty little secret, right, pastors? We don't like saying that. Uh, I think you maybe, maybe, unlikely, but maybe you can even be a little spiritual and not go to church, attend church, or be a part of a church. Uh, so why should people who claim to be followers of Christ uh, have anything to do with the church, right? If it's not mandatory, if you will. The good news is this isn't a modern day problem. The writer in the book of Hebrews uh, they, he confronts the people about church and the need for church and the life of the church. And he explains to us in God's word really plainly why the church is so important. He reminded them that New Testament Christianity is a team sport. New Testament Christianity is a team sport. It takes a team. Nowhere in the Bible do we see believers isolated on their own, doing their own thing. that don't need anybody else and they don't need the church. No one, anything to do with the church. You don't find that in the Bible. 
So why should we care about the church? Why should we go to church? Well, the first reason is because we keep each other strong in the faith when we come together as a church. We keep each other strong in the faith when we come together in the church. Uh, several times, the writer of the book of Hebrews uses this two-word phrase, let us. Now let us and let us. It's never let me, let, let us, let us. He's talking to the church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, he says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. To confess something means to agree with each other. Uh, own something, to agree with, to say the same thing about something that somebody else is saying. That's what it means to confess. Our church is a group of people that have come together and they're confessing the same thing. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We confess that the Bible is the word of God. We confess that Christ died on the cross for our sins and he bodily, physically was raised from the dead. It is that confession that holds us together, that binds us together. And it is in this faith that we strengthen each other. And we can only do that when we come together. The author of Hebrews used the same phrase earlier in Hebrews 4 and verse 14. He said, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us, us hold fast our confession. In other words, hold fast to what we're agreeing on. We do not worship a dead prophet. We worship a risen Savior. You know, normally when somebody dies within a few generations, you kind of forget all about them. That didn't happen with Jesus. He changed everything, right? He changed everything because when he came out of that grave and he conquered hell, death, and sin, and once and for all, we know that we can have hope in Christ. And when we gather together as the local body of believers, we're confessing that blessed assurance that we have in Jesus. We're just saying, man, the resurrection happened. It's real. And it, it, and it changed everything. We're saying to a world full of sin, listen, Jesus is the hope for forgiveness. We're saying to a world full of war, Jesus is the hope for eternal peace. We're saying in a world where death happens every day, that in Jesus, there's hope for life. We're saying to a world full of hatred and racism and bigotry and just ugliness, that Jesus is the hope for love. And we only do that as we come together as believers and confess the blessed hope that we have in Jesus uh, the author goes on in the Bible and, and tells his church in Hebrews 6, 19, he says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. I love that. As an anchor of the soul. I mean, what ship, what boat is going to head out without an anchor? Uh, and so uh, we know as believers that Christ is the anchor of our soul. That means no matter what financial problems you're going through, spiritual problems, emotional, relational, marital, physical, whatever it is, we have this anchor for our souls, Christ Jesus. Uh, and we keep each other strong as we come together and we confess Jesus is Lord, man. And, and so uh, in Hebrews 10, 23, he says, for he who promised is faithful. Christ is faithful. He should find us being faithful to each other and to him. There is an, man, there is an anchor for our soul. And his name is Jesus. And he will never fail us. And we're strengthened in that as we come together. So we strengthen each other. But the second thing is uh, we push each other forward. So we strengthen each other, but we also lift each other up. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another so that we may stir up love and good works. Everything that the writer in the book of Hebrews is telling us is based on a principle that you have to understand that the Christian life isn't simply me and Jesus, 
The Christian life is us, man, us and Jesus. We're in it together as believers. Uh, we have a commitment, a bond. We are family. Man, I got a brother right down there right now in Florida, and uh, and I'm praying for my brother. You want to know why I'm praying for my brother? Because he's family. And when you get saved, give your heart to Christ, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You become a part of a new family, a body of believers, right? Those who have trusted Christ, and you need to be part of that family so we can push each other forward. We can lift each other up. Christianity is a team sport. And uh, when you're playing the team sport of Christianity on your own, you are living in sin and you're backslidden. Uh, you become a Christian by being a follower of Christ, right? And as you follow Christ, he's going to want you to be part of his bride, the church. Now, I'm going to give you a part of this devotional thought that you're just absolutely going to love. And I think some people live by this, but not the right way. God has called you to go to church and stir things up. To stir things up, right? But not to call problems. We're, we're to go to church to stir each other up. It says to stir up love and good works, not to aggravate, not to gossip, not to drag each other down, but to motivate each other and love each other, man, the way that only fellow believers in Christ can love each other. We're to serve others and then only the way that believers can serve each other. Do you know what makes a, a marriage strong? Um, I should have brought Alicia in here so she could, uh, she could tell you. Uh, but uh, the two things are necessary for a strong marriage, love and service. We've been talking about it, Grace, the last couple of weeks about how love gives. Uh, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved and he gave. There is no love where there's no giving. There's no relationship where there's true love, mutual love, where there's no giving at all. And that's true in a marriage. Real love gives. So there's serving and there's loving within a marriage. So there's loving and giving. And for you to be happy in marriage, you have to know that you're loved and, that, and also know that your spouse gives and serves you as you serve them. And when you think about couples that have been married for like 50 years, man, they have figured this out. They understand about love and and service. But let me ask you a question. You take a couple that's been married 50 years. How strong do you think their marriage relationship would be if they only saw each other at Christmas and Easter? Right? If they only saw each other at Christmas and Easter, right? That was the only time they got together. How much love being and serving is going on in that relationship? Not a lot, man. Right, And so when we come together as a body of believers, we love and we serve each other. We stir each other up in good works and love. Man, it's when we come together that we're at our best. It's when we're separate that we are at our weakest. If you're a follower of Jesus, you love Jesus. And you need to want to be where Jesus is. And I'll tell you where Jesus is going to be this Sunday in a real way. He's going to be with the Church, Matthew 18, 24, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You ever heard that? Oh, the old joke. The kid, he got sick. It was Palm Sunday. And he got sick and he had to miss church on Palm Sunday, running a fever. But the family had commitments. They were serving. So they all had to go and leave little uh, little Johnny home by himself. And when the family come back, they came back with those palm branches. And little Johnny's like, man, uh, you know, what happened? To, what are those palm branches for? And, and his parents are like, well, when Jesus walked by, we waved the palm branches at him. And little Johnny said, great, the one Sunday that I miss and Jesus actually shows up. <laughs> Listen, Jesus will show up every Sunday at church. And when you're not there, man, you're just missing out on a special blessing as we uh, push each other forward. But we also lift each other up. And we come to the part in these verses in Hebrews why he's even talking about this to begin with. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. And so it turns out that bad habits have been around for a long time. There were people back in the day that were neglecting the church. He's talking to a very specific group of people, believers. And he's talking about them getting together at a very specific place, the church, and at a very specific time, the first day of the week. These are people that weren't, they were believers, man, like maybe you. And they weren't, they weren't rejecting church. They were neglecting the church. 
They weren't rejecting the church, but they were neglecting the church. It just didn't make their to-do list, man. It just wasn't a priority for them. They didn't see the sense of urgency. They didn't understand. They decided for whatever reason that being part of the church with God's people just wasn't important. And let me tell you, if it was all about you, maybe it wouldn't be that big a deal for a little while for you not to go to church. If it was all about you, Right, if it's just kind of about your what's going, what God's doing in your life, maybe you could get by without the church for a little while. But the truth is, and what the Bible teaches us is that man, it just ain't all about me, it's not all about you, it's about us. He goes on to say this in verse 25, he says, But exhorting one another, so don't forsake this assembling together, don't forsake coming together so that we can exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. One ministry that everybody can fulfill in church is the ministry of encouragement. Man, you know, I'm a pastor and people often will come through and, you know, tell me, hey, a good message or, or and things like that. And I think sometimes they're just being polite because I, I think it's stunk. But now many of them, they're just so sincere and loving with their encouragement. Man, it's just a blessing to be around them. And you watch them. They go throughout the church. They're encouraging everybody. The ladies in the kitchen, whoever, somebody's serving, the Sunday school teacher, the green. Oh, you're doing a good job. You see it all the time. I see it every week at Grace Baptist Church. These people don't have a PhD. They've got a uh, a, a PhE. They've got their doctorate of encouragement. Uh, don't ever take for granted what encouragement you are to other people. Don't take for granted what an encouragement your faithfulness to your church family is, even to lost people. As they realize this thing means something to you. What an encouragement it is to people that don't even go to your church, but they just know that you're there faithfully and that, and that um, your faith is important and that it's serious to you. And you take the word of God seriously enough to come together right? Because we're better together. We're stronger together. It's when we're apart, when we have all of our problems. When you fellowship with God's people, you will be energized by the Spirit of God. You need to attend a church and get involved. There's not, listen, if you don't believe, if you're a believer, I'm a Christian, you say, I, I've trusted Christ. I've repented. I've turned from my sin. I've asked Jesus to save me, right? And he saved me. But I don't want anything to do with the church. I'm just going to be over here doing my own thing. I want to as kindly and as sweetly and as gently as possible uh, tell you that you are out of the will of God. You are absolutely, it's contrary to what the Bible teaches us. I mean, you need to be in church. You need to get involved in a small group. You need to, uh, because for nothing else, for you to go to encourage other people. As we exhort one another, you know, I often wonder, and, and, and uh, it was at a previous church, it happens in every church, but I remember there was one time this guy was a little bit older and he got offended and he got mad about something and uh, and he didn't feel like he was being checked on, right? He's like, nobody called to check on me, you know, blah, 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 blah. I often wonder, how long do you have to be a Christian? How old do you got to get before you realize it's not about you? How old do you have to get? How mature in Christ do you have to become before you become the one checking on people and not the one upset about not being checked on? Because over here is where a lot of people are. Well, the preacher didn't call or my Sunday school class or I went to that church two weeks in a row and then I didn't go back and nobody's even noticed. And da, 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 da. When do you stop being the person that has very shallow needs and you're the person that wants to fulfill very real needs in the life of other people. How long does it take before it's not about you, it's about us, and it's about others? Uh, I, I read this uh, story. There was a professor of anthropology, and he'd heard about a dinosaur that had been killed in South America. And so he launched this scientific expedition, like, we got to find out about this dinosaur that was killed in South America. Excuse me. And so, and he gets in the jungle a few weeks later, and there's this little man wearing nothing but a loincloth, and, and he's standing next to this 300-foot-long dead dinosaur. And this scientist, this anthropologist is like, how did you kill this dinosaur? And he's talking to him through a, 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 a translator. He says, you know, did you kill this dinosaur? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, how did you kill it? And through the translator, and the guy says, with my club. And in amazement, the science... Scientist looks at him and says, man, how big is your club? And the guy says, well, there's about 200 of us. 
<laughs> About 200 of us. Listen, when you walk out the doors of your church, you're walking into a world full of dinosaurs and devils and demons and and just negativity. The good news is, is that we don't have to face it alone. You can have a club. There's an entire army called the church that is ready to do battle with you. When we walk into the church of God, fellowship with the people of God, worship the son of God, and hear the word of God, we will leave that place hand in hand with the family of God, filled with the spirit of God, walking in the love of God as we do life together. Man, the church was not a hassle. The church isn't some burden. Like, good news, you got saved. The bad news is you're going to have to go to church. The church is a precious gift that God has given you so that you can be encouraged and that we can encourage each other. Man, we're just better together. And I want to encourage you again. Listen, if you don't have a church home, you can come Come join us at Grace Baptist, but find a church home that preaches and stands on the word of God and you get plugged in and mature to the point where it's no longer all about you, but it's about us, okay? Listen, I, I hope you have a great rest of the week. I hope you have a great day. Please do pray for our brothers and sisters down there in Florida and Georgia and all those who have been displaced recently. And uh, but again, if, uh, if I can pray for you, leave a comment down below and we will lift you up in prayer. I hope you have a great day. God bless you. Bye-bye.